afternoon. Uh, let's, let's just pray. Lord, I, uh, I thank you for the opportunity to um, speak into the hearts of my brothers and sisters. I thank you, Lord God, that your Holy Spirit is upon us and that you are bringing the word tonight. Um, so, Lord, just um, be with this time of sharing and this time of learning uh, and this time of change. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So as I was preparing for my message today, I had a, in mind the topic, um, the power of belief. Now, you, you may immediately go, oh, Ian's going to give us a sermon on, on believing in Jesus. Well, it, it's actually a, a slightly different twist to that. I remember some years ago um, reading of, I'm pretty sure it was a study that was out of um, Stanford University in the States, and it looked at why people do not change. It looked at why people who, who want to change and desire to change can't change. And, and they came to the conclusion that it was a belief in fear. They believed that they would fail in their change, and so they very often, that, that was the first hurdle they needed to get over in order to, to change. So when I was looking at the topic of the power of belief, it was that, it was that, that lens that I was looking at in respect to belief. So I did a bit of searching, um, and I came across a, a, a science that I hadn't heard about. But um, before we get there, we'll just start at the very beginning, which is genetics. So you all have heard the term DNA? Hey, if you watch NCIS, or if you wanted to know who your great-grandfather was, you stick something up your nose, I'm sure, and, and you send it off because that, we all love doing that. So DNA, is, DNA uh, um, genetics would say that DNA is the root of who you are. My DNA is completely different to you all. It's similar to Suzanne, but it, it's, it's, it's different, it's unique to us. You all know that, right? And it stems from a, a, a theory that was first put out by um, a Darwin in, in the 1850s. I didn't realize he was that old. In the 1850s, Darwin came up with his theories. And then in the 1950s, which is like a century ago, right? <coughs> Sorry. Sorry to those people who were born before the 1950s. Um, <laughs> But, but um, uh, they, they, that's when uh, the genetic sciences identified, constructed, demonstrated to us all what DNA looked like, what the DNA sequencing looked like, what the DNA, uh, there's another name, but I can't remember it, but what DNA looked like. And then in 2003, there was a, a, an evolution, if you like, of that science, which is epigenetics. <coughs> Epi is the Greek word for on top of, in addition to uh, over the top of, covering. And what they found was, whilst DNA does not change, you cannot change your DNA, whilst that you cannot change your DNA, epigenetics found that other influences, environmental influences, can change aspects of your DNA. So in, in, in um, uh, what's the word I want to use? I don't want to use triggers. In, 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 in aspects of your DNA, your environment can either squash or nullify a personality trait, or it can amplify a personality trait. So, your father might have been hot-headed. And therefore, a, gen a genetic scientist would say, you will be hot-headed because you have inherited that gene from your father. However, your environment may actually change that. Your environment may completely turn that around. Um, your, um, just another example. Your, your, your mother may have been an alcoholic. And, and therefore, in your gene, they would say that you have a gene for, um, uh, for, for being addicted. addicted. Thank you, addicted. However, your environment can change that gene, that, that your environment and what happens to you. Um, I, I thought of an example. 
Um, it might not be a great example, but I thought of an example of a lady I knew who, who lived through the Blitz in World War II in, in London. And she used to tell stories about going down into the bomb shelters and having to stay there by the whole night in and, and horrible situations and coming up to a bombed out city. I, I heard the story first from her husband, who, who, you know, a couple of boys were, were around and were talking about, oh, we, you know, the latest Arnold Schwarzenegger movie is really awesome. And, and he was saying, we never watch those kind of movies. And we said, why? And he said, my wife cannot, my wife cannot stand them. So that's an example of her environment will have changed her DNA, not changed her DNA, but would have squashed some aspects of her DNA whilst enlarging some, maybe fear etc. in her DNA. So how does this relate to, um, to my sermon topic? Well, I hope I can tell you. <laughs> <clears throat> so what, when, as I talk to people, I've been surprised by where their beliefs hold them back. So um, uh, I believe that my mother was a, my mother was not an alcoholic. I don't. She still lives. It would be horrible for that rumor to get around. But um, I may believe that my that I I I too will be an alcoholic, or um, I've got a violent temper. Well, that's just the way I'm made. That's the way God made me. And that's the way it's always going to be. And I can't change because that's the way I'm made. I might believe that I'm ignorant, foolish, unintelligent. I may have that belief system. And, and I think, and I believe, and I think you all will all agree, that you have a belief system. You may, you may not be aware of it. And in fact, I think it's more often than not subconscious that you have a belief system. I'm not talking about faith here. I'm talking about almost, I would call it a rule set. I would call it a subconscious rule set, and it kicks in whenever the situation is appropriate. Um, uh, perhaps, you know, Ian has an opportunity to share his testimony, um, but, but perhaps the rule set would typically kick in and say, oh, but nobody wants to hear what I want to say. Um, I, I can't speak in front of other people. Perhaps that rule set might set in. It's a rule set that set in for my mother. My mother never felt that she could, you know, she often used to say, I wish I could get up and speak like you boys do. And, you know, there was nothing holding her back. And she had things to say, but there was this belief system that was holding her back. Now, I've seen that, but when I read about epigenetics, I realized that her belief system was actually having an impact on her DNA. She had quite a good DNA. Her mother and father were strong Christian people. Her father was, have I ever told you this? My, my grandfather, have I told you about the story he was on, on the band going down Queen Street? My, I love this story. My grandfather was a drummer in the Salvation Army band. They used to march down Queen Street for an opening and then march back up again. Well, my grandmother's stepbrother was a tow rag, and he had been absolutely horrible to him. So my grandfather's marching down with the Salvation... This isn't a good story. My, self, my, my grandfather's marching down with the Salvation Army band playing his drum, um, and he spots this bloke on the side street. So he puts his drum down, goes over and decks him one and lands him on the floor. Now that's good Salvation Army stories. <coughs> Now, the other thing that my, my grandfather used to, is known for, was known for was um, uh, from a similar, uh, similar open air, um, finding a, a, a young man struggling um, on the road, he would, uh, on the street. He would, he would pick him up, he would bring him home, he would give him a, uh, give him a shower, he would have a feed, and, and he would be free to go the next morning after a good night's sleep in the, in the house. But uh, all I'm saying is that my mother's belief that she could not speak subdu sub subdued her DNA so that she couldn't perform. But what's so exciting is that, that experiments demonstrate a link between environment and how I'm wired. See, a genetic scientist would say, if you've got the unhappy gene, you will be unhappy. That's it. 
And in a, in a book I was reading th- this week, it, it actually said that it was talking about, there was a, a, a cellular biologist sharing his story. Uh, and he had been uh, teaching on biology and um, uh, genetics for a long time. Uh, and, and he was miserable. And he looked at himself in the mirror and he said, well, I'm just miserable. Uh, he ended up throwing his chair through the front window of his office and, and the University of Wisconsin suggested he take a sabbatical uh, and he ended up in the Caribbean. Uh, and, and that's where he made some of his discoveries. He made some of these discoveries about, hey, my environment can actually impact the way I behave. So where's that really, really cool? Where it is really, really cool is that the Bible, in the very first pages of the Bible, it tells us that we are made in the image of God. That means every individual on this planet who has ever taken breath in their DNA has an aspect of God. And we're told in the New Testament how Christ came to give us life and life abundantly. In Ephesians, it says that we... Thank you, Jesus. In Ephesians, it says that, uh, that he wants to give us a life more than we can imagine. I mean, that just blows my mind. But then Christ talks about being born again. And I realize that when I um, repent... And Christ comes into my life, and I've always talked about him changing my life. I now realize that the Spirit of God can come into my life and have a direct impact on my DNA so that it changes me. It changes me from the boy who believed he was ignorant and was foolish and was of little worth to a boy who felt that he could do exams. It changed me from a a fool into somebody who knew God. And for the first time, understanding the scientific link, I realized that this is God's science. So science only ever looks at what God's already done and tries to explain it. So, you know, we should never be afraid of science. Um, But to see that the gospel that we preach is substantiated in science and it changes the the person that we are so that we don't have to be temper-driven, so that we can change. And we've talked over the last few weeks, we've talked about being sanctified. We've talked about how sanctification is simply... God coming into your life and adjusting things according to the creator so that they work right. Do you realize that that is the Oxford Dictionary's definition of sanctification? And they're not talking about divinity. They're talking about the mechanic. They're talking about the the guy who designed an engine and tuning that engine so that tuning that engine works right. That engine can be sanctified if the person who designed it, if the person who developed it and created it, then tunes it to working at its ultimate performance, then it's sanctified. And Christ sanctifies our life. He tunes our DNA to be according to what he had intended for us, which is an abundant life, which is a life beyond our imagination. Whether we've got one year left, five years left, or 50 years left, or 70 And it all starts with repentance. We'll deal with repentance another day. It's a big topic. But realize this. If you have never known God before, if you have never turned to God before, then the the one thing that you're repenting from is eternal God who created me, I've ignored you all my life. And that's something to say sorry for. So that's the start. If you've repented before God before, but there's other things, just get them right. You know, if, it, if, it's, if it's not working, then, then go back to the Creator and get it tuned up so that, that it starts to work again. Amen? 
So we have the mercy seat here. It's a traditional Salvation Army form. The Salvation Army um, is founded, believe it or not, on salvation. Funny that, it's in our name. Salvation, it, you know, it's that. It's the beginning and the end. Salvation says that I, I come to the Savior, He saves me, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, I'm sanctified, I'm working for God. So in, in, the, in the Salvation Army, we, we, we did away with sacraments. And that's sometimes a little bit confusing to people. I've got on the offering table, I've got a lecture from Catherine Booth that deals with that subject really, really well. It's from 1887, so it's a little bit, you need to adjust it a little bit, but uh, it's a real, real good paper um, if you'd like to read it. But one of the things that we have is the mercy seat. And the mercy seat is where you can come and stand, you can come and kneel as a public declaration to just say, hey, I'm putting myself right with the eternal God. So we'll just get the worship team back on up here. Thanks, worship team. We're just going to have a few, a few songs, opportunity uh, for you to, to make that step. Um, if, if, if you're embarrassed, if there's something stopping you from making that step, uh, just make, make the step in your heart at least. Yeah? Make a step in your heart at least. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. Hey, thanks for listening. If you want to hear more or join our community, feel free to come join us down at 532 Donbuck Road, Massey, opposite the community centre. Thank you and God bless.